week. Joel Friday TV coming up after the Hake Report. Uh, that's at 11 a.m. Pacific time. American Anchor Baby is coming up after that. What's up, guys? Uh, we do have the Fallen State on Friday, so that's cool. It's Jockel will be joining Hake today. J O K L. D L J O K L is short for Deep Left Jockel. He uh, last jo- previously joined Hake in September of 20, September like 21st of 2023 AD. So um, he will be joining us today is the plan, man. I do have calls to get to guys. If I have time, I will get to uh, some things. Some of the things I want to talk about with Jockel is uh, why the uh, whites, Christians, the so-called dissidents, have become losers. D- the uh, c- conservatives just constantly losing and caving and or just being mad about the, uh, our so- so-called representatives being a mess. So what a mess. It's crazy. Um, also, we'll hope to talk about, uh, stay fit, get fit, right? Wouldn't that be nice? Hague likes beta jerky, <laughs> indeed. Terrible. Um, and may also touch on the decline of, like, Christianity, civilization, men, marriage, maturity, how it's not happening. It's not happening. It's crazy. So, um, all that and hopefully your calls and your super chats, guys. But anyway, everybody, let's get right on with the show! One, two, three, four. Oh, it's the Hank Report. The Hank Report. La, la, la. How you guys doing? I am fine. I uh, am wearing a nice t-shirt according to JLP. I won't tell you where I got it, which is uh, if you uh, remember our greatest mod spoiler alert, uh, who's take who's on hiatus right now. He's on sabbatical. Um, he tells you where that's telling you when I say I won't tell you where I got my t-shirt. <laughs> It has like a mountain and like Japanese sun over it, oh, rays coming out of it. I don't know if it's Japanese, but uh, nice to see you guys. Well, nice of you guys to see me. <laughs> Before I get to my guest Jockle, who ought to be joining me uh, soon here, I will put in the timestamps exactly where he joins me after the show. I want to get to a call or two here. Jeff in Louisiana wants to comment on Black History Month. We're in February. Uh, this is the 21st of 2024 AD. What's up, Jeff in Louisiana? Not much, hey, man. I just want to get a couple of people you can celebrate Black History Month. Okay. The news. You can celebrate Brandy Willis for turning Georgia Republican. You can celebrate <laughs> Tiffany Maynard, the ghetto city girl mayor of Illinois, of uh, Dillon, Illinois, for turning Republican. You can celebrate Eric Adams, the mayor of New York, for turning Republican. And Brandon Johnson for turning Chicago Republican. <laughs> uh, that's clever, man, because they're doing such a bad job that they are turning people Republican. And Republican is a little bit less insane, allegedly, than Democrats. Demon rats, I call them. Well, if you watch, the, if you watch like, I watch videos. I ain't going to mention the names. I don't want to me for my show. I watch videos of people do street interviews and all that stuff. They're not Republican. They're Trump. I mean, they're they're Trump. They're just Trump. And it, it's these, these mayors like that doing that crap that's turning people to Republican. So that's what we need to celebrate. We need to call it, we need to call it Trump Month. Trump Month? 
Because they're against huh? Trump. They're just uh, they're just all about attacking Trump, basically. No, because they're tyrant Trump. Because Trump's winning everything. Oh, okay, yeah. I I, I mean, really it, appreciate Trump. Trump loves the blacks, and so should we. But maybe not in the way that Trump does them in terms of letting them out of prison. But other than that, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just stuff happens. But it's just funny that all these mayors. Ha- ha- are you familiar with Tiffany Maynard in Illinois? Tiffany Hayner, Haynard or something like that? Maynard? Yeah, Hayner, something. Yeah, Hayner. I've heard the name, and I think I... Did JLP cover her? I think that she was just this corrupt mayor. JLP covered her on yeah. his show. And she spent, she spent $164,000 on a Chevrolet Tahoe for them to drive her in. <laughs> That's a... I kind of appreciate the shamelessness of these black gals. I think that we should be just as shameless, but for the truth and for what's right. I mean, not shamelessly just abusing stuff, but just no, just, just for, pointing out what the wrong, wrong, wrong is. I mean, yeah, you got count up there. The matter of fact, yesterday the it was on the news that the they've had there's a dude. Well, they had the FBI come in to investigate her, but there's a. The reason it started because a black guy that owns a U-Haul business, a trucking company, got denied his license or renewed his business license because she because he was a supporter. So all these people start calling the FBI on her. Wow! And now the FBI is investigating her. Nice. So the liberals, the liberal FBI is in basically liberal FBI is okay. investigating the liberal woman. They have to prove. Yeah, but the one thing that's nice about the the whites and some of the Jews and and them, they have to have at least a semblance of law and order. At least pretend to be following the law. <laughs> and and pre- convincingly to, to to many. Whereas the blacks don't even care, most of them. Many of them. But the thing is, most. people like you call her, uh, from Phoenix, Joe from Phoenix, it's white people doing it. It's not white people doing it. The black people are calling in on them because they're getting screwed. Right. Yeah. And that, that's what you got to understand is is you know, what you got people like Annie Willis are all they're all dependent on her. You know, that's a powerful black woman, all this crap. Mm-hmm. But the people that are living through it that are of black Americans are seeing what's happening to them. You know, we don't we're not supporting the campaign, so I can't really have a business like money. Yeah. They're not supporting the campaign. I mean and black people are seeing this and start to wake up to it. They're waking up in anger though. They're going from they're going from one opinion to the next opinion which is not true awakening, you know? They're still just self-interested pe- uh, people. It's not as though they love white people all of a sudden, you know? Some of them might. Some them. of them might awaken to it, but... It's not... It's not. I, I agree there. It's not them loving white people, but the point is, is once you get on thinking, well, i say it this way. A lot, a lot of people are just saying, well, they're screwing us, so I'm just going to go to Trump. Right. They know nothing about policy, nothing about what he does, nothing about, nothing about, nothing about Trump. Yeah. And Got they it. just want to vote that way this time to get a better thing. Yeah. But and when I'm, they see, but when they see the better, my hope is when they see the better deal that he offers them, they just start to look into what he does. Yeah. And what he's pushing. True. Yeah. You got to start somewhere. Yeah, and hopefully that that turn them over. Yeah. You know, turn turn. Well, you know, it's uh, yeah, we kind of been screwed, you know, and I, that's what I'm hoping to, to do to wake people up to what's happening. That would be nice, indeed. Yeah, man. but you, you can't, you can't, you can't. Uh, then you gotta start somewhere. You can't just. Uh, anyway, man, that's all I have to say. I want to give you a reason to celebrate the month of February. I, right on, man. I was born on Black History Month. <laughs> <laughs> Who was born on Black History Month? I was. <laughs> you were? Wow! Happy birthday, man. My birthday's Friday, man. I'll be 42. okay. Forty-two. That's awesome. I'm forty-two as well. Uh, well, yeah, happy early birthday. I hope you make it. Yeah, man. You have a good one, man. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye. Oh, man! <clears throat> David and Ocala call back. <laughs> I was so eager not to get a click because Jeff is really quick on the click. You know, when a click when you hang up on, on uh, the host. And I try to avoid it. I try to be quick on it. And my... F- Finger was on the drop David button rather than the drop Jeff button. Sorry, David. <laughs> In Ocala, Florida. What a mess. Hake, so jumpy. 
a little jumpy on the uptake, Ake. But David in Ocala, Florida, is back. Thank you, David, for calling back. Apologies. I didn't mean to hang up on you, obviously. I, I thought that was what happened. Right. You hit the wrong button. Yep. James Bond. Uh-huh. Hey, uh, I was calling to talk about these women, but, you know, he pretty much he already spoke about the Tiffany Hayner girl. You know? Yeah. She's kind of cute. Like, Isn't she kind of cute? <laughs> Physically. Thug, Just man. purely she on the outside. You should listen to her talk at the city council and everything like that. She's just nothing but like that video where that guy goes, she's from the streets. I mean, it's (laughs) unbelievable. Right. She just, no, her education level has got to be very low. And anyway, the FBI is finally, you know, getting involved with this thing because this girl is just crazy. Right. Uh, (laughs) So did she violate like so-called federal law? Well, she's just doing crazy stuff like um, she wrote into this thing where, it, okay, she gets $224,000 a year for her job. Wow. She put in this oh, wait, proposition. Oh, wait, that's almost a quarter million dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. She gets that. And so she uh, put in some deal where whoever, the next mayor will only get $25,000 a year so nobody will run against her. Whoa. Yeah, Whoa. That, that, that that Tahoe we talked about. That's smart. <laughs> that Tahoe only, excuse me, only costs like ninety eight thousand, but the total payback's around one hundred and fifty. So that that means did she upgrade Social everything? Security, huh? Did she upgrade everything? Why does it cost so much? Because of the interest. So whoever Social Security number she's using's got bad credit. You, know oh. you don't go buy a $98,000 car and have to pay back $150,000 unless the rate's sky high. True, I guess. Yeah, so enough <laughs> on her, them, man. Or uh, And then you got, well, you got this uh, Marilyn Mosby out of Baltimore that's getting uh, in trouble for mortgage fraud. You got the Really? Hammer. Mosby? I'm, I'm yep. familiar with her because she was the one who charged those officers, I think, in the Freddie right, Gray right. case like 10 right, years ago. Exactly. Right, exactly. She was shameless back, back then. Now. Huh? She was shameless back then. She's like, I, know. I heard your cries of no justice, no peace. And that was, there was a black female mayor, too, at that time in Baltimore, Maryland, who said, we gave them room to destroy about the blacks um, and Black Lives Matter and Antifa destroying the city of Baltimore. This was pre, this is not the 2020 insurrection. This is the 2014, right. I guess, insurrection or something, 15, 16? Something like that, yeah. yeah. Terrible. They Under Obama. Crazy. Validated by Obama, I think, too. Well, what you got is you got, you know, that old saying, you can take the girl out of the hood, but you can't take the hood out of the girl. That's what's <laughs> going down with these women. When you listen to them speak, I mean, when you listen to Fannie Willis talk about, I gave him a G, okay, instead of a thousand bucks or whatever. <laughs> I mean, just a total disrespect in the courtroom of that woman. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, you're talking about I mean, Fannie Willis. Um, yeah. Yeah, she was very disrespectful, and and the the angry. You can replace hood with anger. I don't. I don't really have a problem with using the term G, even though it is very informal and not proper. But G is not like a sign of anger, but the bad attitude really is, and the corruption. Well, yeah, it's just the it's the level of her, uh, just. Her the verbiage she used is yeah. just juvenile. Okay? Yeah, she, she sounds like a a, a high school girl. You know, True. She, she she doesn't need to be the district attorney. Okay. Yeah. And you know what they see? What they do is they go. You know that thing. I'm a powerful black woman. I'm yeah. a black queen. All this stuff, man. And they think they're better than everybody else. I know. Right? They they think they're e- they claim to be equal, but really what they're saying is they're looking down on you. Because exactly. in their imagination, they think that you're looking down on them. And some of us probably are, because we see how ghetto they act, or degenerate, bad attitude, nasty, brainwashed, arrogant they act. And some of us give in to that thought of hatred, as JLP mentioned, with regard to that black female attorney general from New York, um, uh-huh. Letitia James. He said, look right. at her and don't go with the thoughts of hatred. And just look at her, how she's speaking and her eyes and all that. Uh-huh. And uh, 
they detect when you, or they imagine, they imagine that you're hating them because they're a black woman. But right. no, you're hating them because they're giving out hatred, and a lot of people well, hate those who the hate them. Com- you can feel the vibe coming off of them. You're right. You're going to think, think this is funny, man. I went to my buddy's church Sunday, uh-huh. the black church. Uh, you know, I think I told you before that I went to it. Anyway, he, he wanted me to go again, so I go there. I'm sitting there, and I, all of a sudden I realize I look behind the choir, and I see this sign, Black History Month sign, and how this doctor so-and-so is coming from Gainesville to speak. And uh, and I forgot. I was like, oh, yeah, this is Black History Month. At a church so they're the talking about Black History Month. Yeah, they had a yeah they had a banner behind the choir hanging up there about some body that was coming to speak. Okay, they worship blackness. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I realized, oh my God, it's Black History Month, and uh, and I'm the only white person there. What now, phonies celebrate Black History Month? You got to be raised well, in you brainwashing. Be bringing that into a church, man. I know. That's what I'm saying. So what anyway, about like just what, normal people don't even celebrate so-called Black History Month? Although I've had. We've had callers who grew up so-called celebrating Black History Month. One of my, one of my uh, faith, most faithful callers and chatters said that he was raised with Black History Month. That's really? wild to me. Well, anyway, when the preacher yeah. got stopped talking about him, I almost blurted out, yeah, and, and remember, never trust Whitey. <laughs> <laughs> you almost blurted that out? That's funny. I thought that in my head. That's right. The thought I got. Yeah, and remember, never trust Whitey. I'm the only white person in the church. Now, these <laughs> people were nice to me. Don't get me wrong. I'm not yeah. I'm just saying anything bad about them. But listen, I, I wanted to talk about this anger thing real quick. I know you got a guest coming on, so you just tell me, you know. No, go, go ahead. Talk back. Um, you know, anger is like a defense mechanism, okay? It's an emotion that God gave you to take care of business when you need to get take care of stuff, okay? What do you no, think about I don't that? think I don't I don't agree with that. I if you have to if you have to use anger as your motivation to get up and do something, then that's no that's no what I'm talking about is this. There's a video that's going around right now of a young black girl that's in New York and they're trying to kick her out of this uh uh, uh store. Uh huh. And uh, she they're looking for her right now, they ain't found her. On the way out, on the way out of the store, she just slapped this white lady so hard, probably gave her a black eye and stuff like that. Right. That's what I'm talking about. If that was my wife, I'd have jumped on that girl and pulled her hair out, punched her in the face. I mean, there wouldn't have been no, hey, I'm going to forgive you, crap. You hit my wife like that. Even anybody. But that sounds like you would have gone overboard. Sure I would have. See, that going overboard, see, anger brings, possesses you and makes you go overboard uh, past what you're supposed to do. And then you bring trouble on yourself that's unnecessary. Well, well here's another example. Let's say you don't wait, 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 wait. Let's stay with that I'm example sure. and admit that that's a bad example of a res- an angry response. Well, I'm just trying to prove a point that it's a defense mechanism. That's not defense, though. The, defend yourself. You went past. You, know? def- you went past defense into uh, getting yourself in trouble in your imagination. This is just theoretical. He never actually did this, okay? No. Except, except as a kid. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah, I did as a kid. Mr. Pink says you're re-worshipping the devil. That's not so. See, y'all are always talking about that. It's just like, you know, telling this guy that, uh, not you, but uh, Jesse telling this guy that his mother's the devil, his wife's the devil, and, you know. Well, it's not that that they're the actual devil. It's just that the devil controls them. Well, yeah, the devil controls anybody who's uh, who's angry, who's not born again. Okay, if anyone possessed again, by this the devil's got you. Anyone huh? possessed by this spirit of of uh, emotions. Well, you got God given emotions, man. You know. You think it's a God given emotion to sure that what these is. women have? No, no. no you I'm think it's a God given emotion that would make you pull out a woman's hair just because he slapped your your wife? Oh yeah, I jumped. Your on second her wife. Her. Your I second wife, by the way, Mr. Christian. <laughs> right, my second wife. Which is That's not, true. which is not legitimate in the eyes of the Lord. I don't well, think. Well, either is this. Either is this. Forgive your mother and return to your father. That's not in the Bible. But it's in the. It's right in the eyes of the Lord. Forgive your mother and return to your father. Are you kidding me? That's. That's not. That's not biblical. 
No. It's I not biblical? You don't think it's Bible. right in the eyes of the Lord to forgive your mother and return to your father? Oh, sure it is, but that's not your ba- you're, you're, he's but you're, based. He's always But you're comparing thought, you're comparing that. you're comparing uh pulling a woman's hair out for slapping your second wife and second having a second wife is clearly against what the Bible says. Forgiving and yeah, return I mean, forgiving your mother and returning that. to your father is not against what the Bible says. Well, look, you know, right? Have to <laughs> right? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Right. Let's stay with that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so that's yeah, I, so you're giving well, me logical it, fallacies. It says you can only only under adultery are you allowed to get divorced, okay? Right, right. and it never uh, says you can remarry unless she's uh, dead. Unless she's what? Unless oh, you're dead? widowed. If you're widowed, then you can I don't, remarry. Look, you know, right? That's probably the that's probably the last thing on the list of the stuff I've done. Okay, so you I'm know, just I'm saying, saying I'm just perfect. saying, right or wrong, it's that's what the Bible seems to say. Yeah, well, the Bible seems to say a lot of stuff. No, no, no. Okay, let's say right or wrong. That's what the Bible says. Okay, let's say the Bible does say that, but no, no, no. As, does the Bible say that? that? The Bible says. The Bible said no. The Bible didn't say that you couldn't get remarried after your spouse commits adultery on you. That's sort of left wide open, and you know that. Okay? It doesn't it does say not, that you can remarry. It doesn't say you can't either. It no, only no. says you can remarry if uh, if it's uh It doesn't say divorce and remarry. It doesn't it never says to divorce and remarry. They were trying to trick Jesus, man. They were like, "Who's gonna?" No, no, no. Does it ever? It never says divorce and remarry. It says. If you become a, a widow, you can remarry. Only in the okay. case of uh, a death. And you're not allowed to kill the person and then remarry. That's not right. No, it was, you can only get a certificate of divorce because of adultery. Okay? Because they were wanting to, you know, divorce And even then, and even them. then, it's not clear that, that it's a, um, that that's okay to divorce. It's just that you're not making them an adulteress by, well, by divorcing well, them. Well, where's this thing about, like, don't read the Word of God because that's just going to turn you intellectual? Why are you changing I mean, the subject? Because <laughs> I wanted to talk about that. We can talk about it, but you're changing the subject without uh, without okay. settling on the fact. I thought we did settle that. We did not settle thing. it. Well, what, what what do you want me to answer for you, then? Uh, remarriage is only allowable, according to the Bible, strictly speaking, when there's when you're widowed. When you're uh, when you're widowed. Yeah, it's, have to that's that it's up. only explicitly it was, allowed when you're widowed, and even then they say not to do it. Well, I'm glad I did because you know. No, no, no. Let's. I'm not talking about glad or or what I'll you should do or wh- whatever. I, hey, I'll look you literally up have to time. look it up. Yeah, I want to make sure I got correct information on it. I'm surprised that this is that. not. I'm surprised that you don't know this as much as as much as you know the Bible. Well, that's what I was wanting to talk to you about is about knowing the Bible, knowing the Word of God. So this is perfect. Sean says yeah. only when you're widowed and the brother of the man who's who's dead, the brother the brother, and the the okay. So basically, yeah, what Sean because, says that was, is uh, if the woman doesn't make a baby by the by the man whom she married. The brother is supposed to marry the woman and make a baby for the late brother. Oh, really? Yeah, and then God killed never, that man who... There was a man who didn't want to make a baby by his late brother, and so he he spilled his seed upon the ground. Sorry, ladies. But uh, God saw that that was evil in his eyes, so he killed that man for it. That was in the Old Testament. Huh. Wow, huh? Yeah. Selfish people, evil. But anyway, I'm not. I'm not telling you you should. I'm not telling you anything about what you should do. I know that there's a whole lot of Christians who've divorced and remarried, and now supposedly they're making it work. Trump himself is divorced and remarried many times, and I call mm-hmm. him a, a bro- one of our brothers in Christ, a light of the a light on the earth. But he's suffering for it. His children's. I mean, he, he he's. His family is suffering for it, you know? He's catching some trouble ba- back for it because his children are uh, not as alpha as he is. Oh, oh, so that's because he got divorced, his children aren't alpha enough? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's partly, I mean, I, I would 
I would hazard a guess that that has something to do with it. Children of divorce are oftentimes messed up. Not that children of, of marriage that quote unquote stays together are not messed up. They're messed up too, but children of divorce are, get messed up. And the remarriage makes things even worse. Well, what do you think about telling some guy that the reason why his daddy beat him was because he was too much like his mother? That I makes mean, a lot of just, sense. No, that's just that. That's yeah, ridiculous. huh? I mean, that no, wait, 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 what irritates a man enough to, uh, to physical violence, but, uh, but the, but the hating of the evil that's coming from, from the woman, and then seeing the child do that, that was, that's, it's not just, it's not justified that the man does it, but it's why he does it. It's spiritually no why he does that. There's no reason that a, a, a father should beat their child. Okay? I know, but why like do that. they do it? Because they got they got uh, psychological issues, man. They're right. messed up in the head, probably now. Right, and they're responding, like and that. they're responding to the to the to the evil spirit that possesses the child passed down from the mother. You've seen how children act just like their. Uh, their mothers sometimes, and the mothers don't even like seeing that. They start to, they're like, oh no, my boy's gonna turn out gay, or something like that sometimes. Or uh-huh. the, they think just like the, the mother, they act out and get all vicious just like the mother, it's crazy. Right, I have seen that, okay, because I've, I had two young black salespeople. And don't you, were, and, and you, t- no you yourself, you yourself have been tempted to, uh, to um, beat probably the the offspring of single mothers, so you're no different from the um, child beater. What? Because I was an offspring from a single. No, mother? No, no. Because you've been tempted to beat the offspring of a single mother who who act just like their mothers, angry, oh, violent, no, I didn't vicious. Say I was going to beat them up. Yeah, yeah. You were going to beat the person. The, 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 the oh, theoretical that person slapped that woman? in this hypothetical scenario of that woman who slapped your wife, your second wife. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, anyway, so that's you're, not, right right? About the bla- you're right about the black thing, men thing because I had two salespeople that didn't have a father in the house. Yeah. They were raised by their mother and their grandmother. Right. Anytime they got upset about something, they did act like a woman. See? And that, mm-hmm. and, and, and men who are, who are, have any anger in them, hate that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's man, uh, manly to act like a woman. Not like only that. is it not manly, but uh, people hate that. People hate the weakness of, of men. It just makes you want to, uh, if you're possessed by evil too, then it makes you want to um, abuse that person with, uh, with your fists or something like that. If you're, uh, if you're uh, prone to violence, or just be reject or look down upon that person if you're with, if you have that evil spirit in you. Well, but, uh, listen, are you gonna, if somebody's gonna try to hurt you, are you gonna try to talk them out of it, buddy? Are you gonna, are you gonna, is that what you think no anger means? Just trying to talk somebody out of it, or do, (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm just saying you don't like if, if, if has anybody ever tried to hurt you before? Yeah. I mean, I just ask, huh? Yes. Okay. Did it make you angry? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes it didn't. Okay. Sometimes it did. Okay. Well, that's that's built into you to defend yourself. You think that's okay? God given? You think that you need anger to defend not yourself? Not beating your son, not beating your son because he because he looks like the mother or some crap like that. That's wrong. But you don't have to be angry to defend yourself. You're better off not being angry and being able to defend yourself. Well, maybe, yeah, okay. Let me tell you this and then I'll get off the phone because I need to go. True or false, you're better off not being angry and being able to defend yourself before you make your point. You're better off, say that again? Not being angry and being able to defend yourself. I guess so. Yeah, I guess you you would be if you had a level head. Yeah, because then you're not yeah. gonna go overboard and then get yourself catch a catch a felony or whatever. <laughs> well, sometimes you need to be overboard. No. Okay. No. Mm-hmm. No. Well, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but maybe may, maybe you'll understand where I'm coming from. My okay. mother, my my mother, uh, second husband, 
uh, did something and she got upset with him and she threw all of his stuff out on the carport. And I'm seven years old, okay? He comes home, he starts beating her down the hallway. He's mm-hmm. on top of her, slapping her in the face. She's crawling towards her bedroom on her back, trying to get away from him. And, and you're seven bedroom, and you're I'm, seven years old looking at this? <laughs> no, I'm in my bedroom. I'm listening to it. And oh. I'm thinking, man, it's gonna stop, it's gonna stop. And it would stop for a little bit and then it would get cut get back up again. They were right outside my door. Yeah. Okay. Well, I finally I just snapped, okay, and I grabbed this David Bowie knife, Bowie knife that I had bought at the hardware store that my friends and I thought we were so cool carrying them around, you know, on our belts. I grabbed this big old David Bowie knife and I come walking out my bedroom and I say, "Listen, man, if you don't listen, Miss MF, or if you don't get off my mom right now, I'm gonna f and kill you." Well, as a seven year old, you're cussing like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, she had, you did have a mother with a second husband. Yep, I know. I so you became just it. like her and had a second it. wife. Yeah. Anyway, that snapped him out of it, buddy. Nice. And that's the kind of stuff I you think you might have told me this story through. before. I, I might have. But and the you bottom think line is, huh? Just because, just because you stopped a physical thing doesn't mean that you, uh, doesn't mean that that was... Good of you, to, good for you to be angry. I mean, you're a little kid. Of course, you're going to be angry at that point. I well, guess. Well, what I'm trying to say is, you know, that kind of stuff gets ingrained in you, in your psyche and stuff, and it's oh. hard. To, it's hard, you know, when you get older, that's the kind of stuff that causes people to have anger issues. Okay, seven year old child should have never been subjected to that. Why not? <laughs> Were you? You grew up in a. You know, you grew up in a real nice home. <laughs> right. I had, nice, nice, I had a nicey, nice. your mom. I had a nicey, nice Christian home. Sure I, I heard them yell at each other like twice ever. <laughs> right. See. And and they only yelled at each other. It was like that's it. And it was like right. that was traumatizing enough. But the spirits, yeah. the spirit is, the spirit is still traumatized by the anger. And it's not just anger too. It's the nicey, nice. It's spoiling. It's injustices of all kinds. Right. Well, yeah. I'll be the first to admit, hey, I got anger problems. So listen, I know you got what? What time? What? Who's coming on your show today? G- Deep left Jockle. I had told him that ten o'clock is okay. He's over here on the on the west coast, and he's just getting used to the uh, time zone change. So I'll probably oh, have him okay. on in about a half an hour or so. And I have some other callers, but I appreciate talking right. with you. It's well, fun. I appreciate your calls, David. Hey, take care, man. Y'all have a great day. All right, you too. All right, bye-bye. bye bye. Bye. What a nice guy. Pete in Alaska is on the line. Pete, thanks for calling, man. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, good morning. JLP Network is top shelf. Uh, That's nice. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, so many people just can't see the forest through the trees, you know. Uh, that that last gentleman that was oh you remember the time just before Jesus was about to turn them tables and them two broads were fighting over that Christmas ornament and Jesus pulled all her hair out and and <laughs> uh, made her look like Will Smith's husband and and uh, then healed her and sent her on her way yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> right anger anger from the spirit of the month like uh, this this uh outlook on why is it always the woman or this that and the other uh and how come not man or or i know mean man or uh angry man or whatever well that's because they're harboring the spirit of their mother yeah and and they can't see the forest through the trees it's un it's unmasculine to be out of your mind like that they call it mad because you're out of your mind i think uh, right or, or natural um, the emotions and all that stuff. <clears throat> I don't know if if you have children, you can see in their infancy that uh, they don't come with all that emotion, you know. Right. You beat it into them, you know. <laughs> yep. And uh, you know, I'm not advocating whooping kids, but whoop your kids because a little bit of uh, overcoming challenges can. Uh, make you endure, you know, it can, it can strengthen you. Uh, they're trying to take competition away from the youth. Yeah, they're, they're mama-ing them. They're protecting right. their feelings, and, which is, you're supposed to overcome your feelings, not protect and validate your feelings. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of kids, I was 
wondering if if uh, you or any of your listeners or anybody out there really has seen uh, uh, any footage on Jeffrey Epstein walking the 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 walk of shame footage. As he, you know, there's there's no footage on him getting rest. Everyone <clears throat> since we've had the means to record <laughs> uh, the world, there's always the walk of shame. You know, all all, all the any anybody they're getting arrested and, and here's why and here's what and there's footage of it and uh i've never there doesn't s- seem to be any of of good old jeffrey and, and i don't I, know and also- I th- probably because he's smart enough and rich enough to be able to uh avoid such footage <laughs> well, I don't know i've never looked into enough. it I, you know what's uh, funny i don't really look into i've never looked into this funny willis thing Although I did come across one clip, I've never looked into uh, Epstein. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, yeah, uh, I've never looked well, into is Epstein. Is that the wife or something, or the girl? No, girl just Fonnie or... Willis is just this black woman who's kind of oh, a mess. Oh, right, right. The, yeah. yeah, the smirker. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but would you would you want to see that? I mean, who, to me, it's who cares. Uh, well, it's just it's just interesting, you know. Uh, mysterious death. Right. Uh, all of his acquaintances, if you will. Yeah. Some folks who are in that realm of business who had talked to him said he didn't know the lingo, you know, like I'm sure they're your network. You have lingo that's behind the scenes stuff. Everyone knows what's being talked about. And just the average somebody walking into your guys' studio wouldn't necessarily <laughs> right. No, no all, all, yeah. And so <laughs> I'm chuckling because I pictured JLP saying, Yeah, do the tags. <laughs> and he doesn't know what yeah. tags are. I don't even know what tags yeah. are. Yeah, true. Right. See, right. So there's a lingo. And, and the more familiar with it, the more educated you are with it, blah, blah. But, right. Uh, there were people who were in that field of work uh, that, you know, not the whole island thing, but uh, whatever he had is millions of dollars for it. So he's probably just a plant so they can get, uh, you know, blackmail footage on whoever and whenever. And that's possible. I'm sure, I'm sure some folks aren't involved in none of the, the hooky. Right. Yeah. Stuff. Like Trump, for example. Oh, Trump is yeah, on the list. That doesn't mean that he was involved in, in mess. Uh, uh, Danny Glover's on, on the list, I guess. Is that uh, childish Gambino? Uh, what, Danny Glover? Yeah, uh, not to, oh, Donald, is it Donald Glover? Oh, man, I'm confusing no, it with Lethal Donald Weapon. Glover. Danny Dude. Glover is the the older black actor, right? Or no? Yeah, yeah, uh, he was, and Clint Eastwood was part of the, you know, like the Bohemian Grove, and that was like the, that was probably the island before the island, you know? And then all these missing kids, you got the Hawaiian kids missing, you got the, uh, you know, Kids coming across the border, who knows where they're ending up? Yeah, and and then the abortion ritual. Yeah, and I'm not pro-abortion, but if I was, I would say raise the age to 22 or something. Uh, mm. Let them grow up and have a beer, and if they're a if they're a punk, you know, well, let's just handle this right now. <laughs> but, <laughs> Whoa, I, I just about <laughs> that, man. Yeah, That's but funny. I'm not. A, but I, I'm not for abortion at all. But yeah. if I was. I'd say, yeah, uh, raise it on up. I know, uh, that kind of opens your eyes to the whole issue, don't you, doesn't it? Interesting, man. Right. Yeah, uh, well, it would prevent, you know, a lot of a lot of things. You know, oh, I think my kid's making a bomb in the my basement. Personal, my personal take on th- this abortion thing is if they weren't doing it, if we said, no, you're not supposed to do it, we're, we're not going to legalize it, then I believe right. that... Uh, the children who uh, survive would grow up a little bit less vicious, and the mothers would be a little bit less uh, vicious, perhaps. I know that you, there are, there's more than one way to get vicious. People are vicious without committing abortion, of, of course. Sure. All of us sure. have this vicious, evil spirit in us. But when you're allowed to do that, I mean, it just makes the society even nastier. And so my theory about abortion is that it increases the... Uh, for example, the black violent crime and all these other evil, nasty, heartless, cruelty oh, yeah. things that we have in society because people are just 
doing that, and th- many of them already have children. So imagine how yeah. a woman whose conscience is seared is going to treat her children who grow up, and she's the way that she sees life and she values other people's lives. There's a lack of right. value for other human beings. So yeah, anyway. hence raise the age to 22, because imagine <laughs> how well-behaved your kids will be then, you know? That's funny, man. Look, I can run you down to the old clinic and yeah. get some Planned Parenthood going on. <laughs> it's good to hear from uh, you, man. Pete in Alaska. I'm going to have to yeah, run because my... Yeah, blessed, man. I, I appreciate your show and the network. You Thank you. One. All right. All right. Take care. Bye now. Bye. I have my guest with me, Deep Left Jockel is here. Callers, I will get to you, um, especially if you'd like to talk with Jockel this morning. Uh, J-O-K-L, D-L-J-O-K-L over on X, formerly known as Twitter, and on YouTube. Deepleft.substack.com is his substack. He uh, was on the Hake Report in February, in, uh, not February, September of 2023 A.D., and... He was writing a book on uh, the decline of the dissident right, the right wing. Because we used to be in large and in charge, and now we're fringe and extremists, and it's bad. <laughs> but uh, he's, been tra- he's tr- been traveling around, visiting uh, people who like to talk with him. And he's back on the show. Jockle, welcome back to the Hake Report. Are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Chat, press one if you can hear Jockle. J O K L. Not to be confused with Jocko. J O C K O. Are you familiar with him? I actually met Jocko. He oh. he's very easy to meet. You just got to go to his gym, and he's very friendly. He'll go up. He'll talk to anybody. He's very respectful. I mean, for a guy who's as well known as he is, I think he's the most accessible, like friendly celebrity. Nice. Um, he just feels very comfortable meeting new people all the time. And so it's, um, I can't think of anyone else where I'd just be like, oh, yeah, go to this address during this time. And you, it, it's almost like the, uh, the idea of like the king, where it's like, oh, you have a problem? I'll just go to the king's court and like stick around for a while. I'm sure you <laughs> can have like a short conversation with him if it's a really big problem, like he'll understand or something. So, of course, I, I don't think that is possible at a certain scale, but right. that interesting guy definitely kind of embodies those uh, warrior virtues that he espouses. So kind of a cool guy, but um, I don't think he knows who I am because he's meeting like, you know, so many people every day coming to his gym. But yeah, right. I have actually met him before. So we are we are in a small world. Jocko, Jocko is a, Jocko Willink is a former, like, Navy SEAL. Oh, he's w- one of my competitors. I guess he's a fellow podcast host. And he talks about, uh, it's good. Or it's something like that. It, uh, good. Good. You got problems? Good. And, uh, just power through. No excuses. I, I like that. Um, nice, man. So you're, are you in California right now? Yeah, I'm visiting California. Um, It's interesting because there is so much negativity about the state and some of the questions that you mentioned or topics that you mentioned we could talk about of like, how is the right wing doing? How are the white people doing? How are the Christians doing? Right. And I guess the way that I approach those things especially or let's say how is california doing if you do not disaggregate if you are not willing to drill down and be specific then you can find the most extreme cases or even things that are just on the daily you know you can find oh this is what public transportation looks like every single day isn't this indicative of the overall health of this system? I mean, that's what Tucker did in Russia, right? He went to the grocery store, said, look at these grocery carts. This is amazing. I've never seen this. I'm like, bro, if you've been to Aldi's, it's everywhere. But it's actually <laughs> interesting that there are probably white people in America who have never been to an Aldi's right. because Including they me. go to Walmart. Yeah, they go to Walmart. They go to Costco. They go to these other branches. And so there are these kind of two white Americas very broadly. Um, I think Charles Murray, uh, one was called Fishtown. The other one was, you know, he had these two visions of like an upper class white America and a lower class 
white America. And that whole book coming apart is about how, you know, there used to be this one universal American experience. We all watch the five cable news channels. We all watch baseball. We all eat American pie. But that really since the 1960s, uh, there have emerged two very different groups in America, people who basically have kept their marriages together. They have like a, a only a 20% divorce rate. They actually are able to have normal sized families. They have, you know, 2.3 kids or something. They actually can't afford to live in safe neighborhoods. They aren't affected by crime. So all of these things that we would consider normal in the 1960s, those people have maintained those standards of living. Now, the 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 public services, the public transportation, the sidewalks, you know, all of the commons in society have clearly degraded yeah. since that point. Um, but those people, they have a home to go to, they have a neighborhood to go to, they have private schools or sometimes even public schools. I've visited some of these public school districts and talked to people where, you know, if it's one of the best public school districts in California, it looks very different from the average public school district in California. So um, those yeah. are the sort of things I think about when we ask, you know, how is this group of people doing? My question is, how are these groups polarizing? How is, you know, some groups of Christians, the churches are empty. The average age of the parishioner is 80. Other <laughs> groups, yeah. you know, they're having tons of kids and they're growing and they're evangelizing. They're going overseas. And it's a very different story. So whether it's white people or Christian people or American people or Californian people, the question of is this group growing or is it declining? I think is it's not entirely fair because we are so polarized on basically every single issue in society that it seems like, well, actually there's really two big groups of white people. There's two major groups of Christians. There's two, yeah. and we can drill down further and, and get a finer picture, but that would be my, um, my basic response to people who are like, oh, California is terrible. Why would you ever visit there? There's no good people in California. It's actually, there are more Republicans in California than any other state. If you want to find a Republican, just in terms of geography, walking around, you, if you had a vacuum and you were sucking up Republicans and just random people on the street, <laughs> you would have more Republicans in absolute terms in LA than anywhere else, right? Yeah. So this is, um, if you're willing to filter, if you're willing to be selective, if you're willing to, um, I don't know, have, have some strategic thinking rather than just like bemoaning, oh, the sh you know, homeless people are stealing shopping carts or something like there is, uh, there are situations, there are opportunities where you can have great experiences and do very well for yourself, even while maybe public services and the commons and things are showing obvious signs of decline. And I actually believe that is intentional and we can get into that. Interesting. Yeah. I've heard you talk about, uh, well, what, before I had you on the first time, I think you talked about these zombies that, uh, are what many of the homeless people who are on drugs and over aggressive and entitled have become some of them, uh, criminal. And how that's driving out people to suburbs and beyond and making suburbs out of sub stuff that used to be just boonies, rural, and how that used to be an unnatural thing. The cities are much more natural. And these uh, real estate developers are kind of allowing it to happen because they're buying up that land. So they're making money off of the uh, people who can afford to move out there and pay for all that stuff. So it's sort of a... Uh, who could have predicted that type of scam almost it's quite pretty interesting yeah yeah i mean i still basically believe that i i would love to you know uh richard hanania who had that debate um recently i did a review for that on substack with him and curtis yarvin it wasn't it wasn't really a great debate but I don't think that was the point i think it was just a networking event and the debate is like an excuse for people to get together but you know, he's written this book, which I haven't read, but the premise is interesting of like, he said, let's really drill down into civil rights law and what that is functionally as a mechanism. What did that do to American society? And then you look at all of these 
current year things that are so different from how people would have experienced the country in the early 1960s. One of those is real estate. And so this is a really interesting um, phrase I want to throw at you. I think it's very interesting, which is that we've moved from being a racially segregated country to being a financially segregated country, where back in the day, you could have a middle class white family and you could have a rich white family and you know they would have different lives right but the quality of life that they experience the amount of crime the amount of drugs the amount of divorce the amount of atheism right that these things that can significantly impact a person's quality of life or churchlessness we'll say um those things those disparities were not as great yeah the rich people they're always going to have a bigger house and a, a car and a boat and all of those extravagant things better education so on and so forth but they're on some very significant factors. They're actually much closer in average than they are today. Um, and so looking at that polarization as a form of segregation, as a form of saying, we are the rich whites, we are going to live in a gated community. We are going to have private schools or a public school district. That's essentially geographically segregated. If you live outside the district, you're not allowed to go to that school pretty much. Yeah. Um, or it's a lottery system and it's very difficult. So, you know, that is a form of segregating that country. That That is a form of saying this is the good neighborhood where we have the good schools. This is the bad neighborhood where it's good luck. You know, you're on your own, basically. And by creating that system where really uh, for a lot of white people who would say, you know, I just want to live in a white neighborhood and I'm just tired of all, you know, they go on these complain and they talk about the issues and it's like, all you have to do is become rich. Anywhere you go in California, it can be LA, it could be San Francisco. (laughs) If you have enough money, you can live in a white neighborhood. This is the secret. You don't need to move out to Appalachia, West Virginia or Montana or something. You don't have to found like, oh, well, we'll get together enough money and we'll make this all white town. It's like there are 90 plus percent white towns everywhere, every state, every city, every blue city. You can find these places and you just need enough money. So what it's creating is a situation where if you're poor or even if you're middle class, um, you don't necessarily have that option. You're going to have to live yeah. in an area of the country where maybe there aren't a lot of jobs or One of the important things I'd just like to kind of throw out there is I really think that the quality of education is not determined by the curriculum or the funding or any of that. It is the quality of the individuals that compose the institution. So if you have a child and you're like, I really believe in education, I think education is important. I say I agree with you. But if you want your child to have a positive educational outcome, the best way to achieve that is to take a bunch of really smart kids and really smart, passionate teachers and put them all together in a, in a room and just say, figure it out. You know, there's no plan, there's no funding, there's no iPads, nothing. It's just like, you're all smart, talk with each other. And that is how people learn by being around people who are smart and who uh, love education. Um, and so having access to those people, I think, you know, there's this, um, there's this kind of phrase, I don't know exactly the, the tightest way to put it, but People say like, oh, you don't have a right to be around white people. You don't have a right to access white people. I think this is kind of in in terms of freedom of association. Like if I want to have a neighborhood for people like me, you don't have a right to come in um, and live next door to me. Like that's ridiculous. But there is, in a sense, a real privilege to living around people who are very competent. And that sort of competence, that sort of differentiation comes from an early age. So you may not think, oh, well, you know, my child, if they're smart, they'll just figure it out. It's like, no, children and everybody, by the way, we all become like the people around us. If you put a child amongst amongst a bunch of uh, drug using little gangsters, they're going to either adopt that culture or they're going to feel like an outsider, which can make them depressed and really actually lower their intelligence. When you're depressed, it actually does brain damage. (laughs) Or if you put them in a classroom with a bunch of really intelligent kids who love learning and they're super nerdy, but they're also athletic and they're competent in all these areas, like they're going to raise their standards and they're going to view that as, okay, if I want to be socially accepted, I need to push myself in this way. That's really, I think, the best 
like quote unquote education, which is how, you know, the ancient Greeks did it. They had an academy system and school system where you'd bring in kids, they'd be doing gymnastics, they'd be doing all these things. And the idea was like, let's get together all of the best families and all of the best kids and put them together. Um, I could go on at length about that, but I, I want to give going to give you a chance to interrupt me here because I'm going a million miles an hour, I think. I like the uh, notion of freedom of association. And I, I think that this uh, civil rights integration thing was uh, not a good thing. There was this story that one of my callers, Asmador, uh, told me about where his father moved his, the family when he was a kid out of the neighborhood as soon as the first black family moved into his Texas uh, white town where it was safe to play outside and all that. And then later as an adult, he returned to that town and it had turned into like a crime ridden ghetto because although the first black family may have been relatively nice, uh, by and large, they were allowed to just be criminals and not have their families together anymore. The parents married and all that. So the standards went down the drain. And so I think that was a destructive thing, this forced integration thing. But you're right that uh, it's a privilege. The so-called white privilege is the privilege of being raised by decent parents. And uh, for the most part, the whites know how to act in public, even if they're even if they're underhandedly not doing exactly right. You just have the privilege of everybody around you s establishing a relatively trustworthy reputation for the whites. And so that's that privilege that they're complaining about. And so it's a, it's a setup. And you hear about uh, there are other races who grew up amongst the whites. And they do adopt some of the white things, but there's always that temptation and they're literally, physically, somewhat of an outsider. That temptation to be suspicious or separate yourself or think you're different or and complain about something that may not even be entirely real, such as, you know, the racism. A lot of people will complain about racism. And they'll complain about the people who are the least, uh, the least unjust in their discrimination, the least... Uh, unrighteously prejudiced, such as like the whites. The whites are like the most accepting and they're being attacked. And part of it is because they're al they allow themselves to be attacked and they've bought into this fake lie of racism too. And so they're pandering, people pleasing. And so there's like these two evil spirits. One is people pleasing and the other one is just a, a bully. And the evil just kind of goes out of control. I, I don't know if you have any follow-up to that, but I have a question in response uh, sure. to that. I want to, uh, oh, you want me to respond and then you have a follow-up question? Afterwards? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. okay. go ahead. All right, yeah, I'll, I'll just say, I, I mean, we brought this up last time and a caller said, you know, why are white people so weak and why are they letting themselves be trampled upon? And, you know, I think I answered that at the time to say, basically, um, I think that most white people are not super down <laughs> with being trampled on. Um, and that when white people make it appear like they're down with being trampled on, generally, they're playing a little semantic game where when they say things like, I think as a white person, I think white people should do blah, 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 blah. Right. And Jews get accused of this. Uh, I mean, there's a ton of Tim screenshots Weiss. all over Twitter of like, yeah. you know, as a white person, I hate white people and we're so terrible. And then the next screenshot is like, I'm Jewish. I just celebrated Hanukkah or right. something. And, <laughs> and so people go like, hmm, what, what is that about? And the way I would contextualize that, and I think there is a specific Jewish identity and history that informs why Jews tend to be more liberal, because yeah. that's, I think, what is the essence of that. But then asking that broader question of why do white liberals say like, I'm white, and I hate white people. To me, it's because when they say that they're not meaning I hate white liberals, because demonstrably in their behavior, 
white liberals live in white liberal neighborhoods. They go to, you know, if they go to a church, it's going to be an Episcopalian or Unitarian Universalist. That's all <laughs> right. white people. They're going to send their kids to an all white or highly white public school. They're going to date or marry um, another white person. These are all just statistical facts about white liberals. So why are they like saying I'm against white people? I'm against white people. It's because when they say that, it is this way of cloaking their out group enmity as a form of um, universalism and moral virtue. Yeah. So they're saying like, I don't like rednecks. I don't like hillbillies. I don't like cops. I don't like white people who are uh, of a warrior mentality. I don't like white people who use violence. I'm a priestly person. I'm I'm someone who likes the fine arts, maybe kind of androgynous or, <laughs> yeah. you know, over civilized, domesticated, whatever. And I'm afraid of and my greatest enemy is is that white bully, that white Chad, that white jock, um, that white Republican or something that is the guy who is going to give me a swirly. Maybe some <laughs> of these people are bullied. Maybe some of them never were, but kind of on an instinctual level. They feel that their competitor in their niche is not um, a person of another race, but it's other white people who basically they're competing with for resources, cultural resources, sexual resources um, for dominance. That is the contentious issue of our time. It's not actually I, I really don't it's, think the fundamental political division is like black versus white or white versus Asian or something like that. I really do think that. The, the, the greatest degree of political hatred in this country has to do with the divide between liberals and conservatives. And that is a divide that has to do with um, class in the, or caste in the sense of um, that division of priests and warriors and merchants. That's a very fundamental psychological civilizational division that has to do with um, almost our body type, uh, our, our facial features. Like this is something that runs very deep and that in the past wasn't as pronounced i think um and is becoming much more pronounced so i agree in that a lot of that stuff is true and it's um it is it feeds into the temptation and they're not really as self-sacrificing as they pretend you're right there is a self-righteousness oh they say we but they rather mean these other people we need to be do better. They're meaning these other people need to do better or you need to do better. That's true. Um, I want to know if you believe that um, people are evil. Mo everybody, if everybody's evil at heart, at root. Okay, yeah, interesting question. Um, the way that I would think about this is that I, I would first of all say that I don't think animals are evil. I don't think the lion is evil for eating the gazelle. And I think that sin and evil, these are psychological states. These are, um, these are things that occur within us. So you could have, for example, a, um, you know, you're walking along in the safari or something and the lion comes and it jumps up, attacks someone, and kills someone. That's a tragedy. Maybe that's a loss of life. You know, that we're, we're sad about that, but we don't hate the lion. We don't resent. I mean, maybe some people would, but I don't <laughs> actually think most people on intuitive level understand, like, you don't need to hate the lion. You don't need to bring it to court. You don't need to make it understand how guilty it is and read out, you know, the sentence before it. There's no sense of like, needing to get justice against the lion. Um, whereas if a person does this, and then we get into all kinds of cases of, oh, well, what if they were crazy at the time? What if they are mentally incapacitated? What if someone, um, you know, was under the influence of drugs or alcohol? And so there's all of these factors in edge cases where we ask, like, was a person morally responsible? And that determines, that's the difference between murder and manslaughter. That's the difference between um being a teenager and racing your car down the road and not realizing um someone jumped out and then you hit a, a mother with a baby in a stroller and that is obviously a tragedy but is it the same evil 
as someone who fails to poison their parents with with arsenic or something, uh, but they had the intention to do it and they thought it out and they planned it. Yeah. So to me, evil is about um, our ability to consciously moralize. That is, we are not just acting instinctually according to our impulses, but we have the ability to introduce restraint um, of our impulses through a moral code. And sometimes our moral code makes us violent when we otherwise wouldn't be. Like you have people cheering on a war in a foreign country, in a foreign land that they have nothing personally to do with, but they're like, yeah, I hope those people on the other side die. So morality can actually make you more violent But in other cases, you might want to punch somebody in the face, but your morality tells you not to. So evil comes, I think, when there is a break in that system. And that can be very big in the case of serial killers, I think, are obsessed with the idea of being evil. And that's why they imitate and emulate um, sadistic practices and torture and things like that. There's also really small examples of evil. Like I would say basically passive aggression. Right. Where you, you're kind of upset about something or you're upset at someone. And so instead of coming out and just doing something obvious, you, you're kind of um, disrespectful or you're rude or you pretend to be their friend, but you're actually subverting them. So this is how I would define evil is I would say it's, it's a person who has received some kind of moral code or moral law, and they've actually internalized it. It's not something that they're, that's foreign to them. And I think this maps really well onto um, the Christian concept of sin, which is in the story of Genesis. Um, you know, the, the animals of the garden are not, they don't really have the capacity for sin or evil. They're just kind of walking around doing their thing. But because Adam and Eve have this knowledge, this singular knowledge of like, don't eat this fruit. And then they do eat the fruit. There's this clearly drawn metaphor or, you know, connection between the knowledge of good and evil and the actual ability to sin. So in order to sin, you have to have knowledge of this. And, you know, for Christians, this is a literal like historical event that happened. Um, But the way that I look at it is this is a uh, symbolic metaphor that at least, I mean, it could be both historical and symbolic, but from my perspective, it's a symbolic metaphor that shows and demonstrates and helps us understand, you know, where feelings of guilt and shame come from. It comes from knowledge. It comes from that act of moralization, of uh, realizing that there is a social standard and failing, even sometimes language, right? Sometimes you say a word wrong or you pronounce a word wrong and then someone corrects you and you feel a sense of shame. That's like a very basic, um, we wouldn't think of that as morality, but it is like there's a certain way to talk English. And if you don't talk English the right way, you're less than, you're lower, you're unclean. And so this like permeates every aspect of our, um, you know, our, our conscious social life is this threat of evil, this threat of knowing the right thing, but um, through some kind of um, internal pain or cognitive dissonance, we actually seek to do the wrong thing. I don't know if that um, so is helps that, you get where you want to go with this. Does that apply to everybody? Uh, what, what do you mean? Do, where, that, where everybody has that, e- that evil. Well, insofar as someone has internalized a moral code, they all have the potential for evil. And the extent to which a person is not capable of evil would be the extent to which um, their ability to understand that moral code has been altered or suspended. So someone who is sleepwalking or someone who's under the influence of drugs or someone who um yeah has a psychotic break or something we could all recognize there are and have been instances where um someone is less culpable of evil or they're less capable of evil because their their rational reasoning faculties that allow them to understand what they're doing are somehow 
damaged or suspended? I think that, um, I think that somebody who has a mental break or who's, who gets high on drugs, especially if they're doing it on, on purpose at, on any level, then that was evil that drew, drew them to, to do that. And so they're still on some level responsible for evil, even if they wouldn't act have the way that they say they uh, cut off a bunch of heads on drugs or after a mental break, the evil drove them to do to have that mental break or to take those drugs in the first place. Yeah, um, I, guess... I could see a Down syndrome like Down syndrome or some of those people seem innocent and they don't tend to do the evil things, I don't think, I don't know, <laughs> that normal people do. So, but the cases that you talked about where in temporary insanity or high on drugs or whatever, they, I think they're still responsible on some level, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there have been stories of people keeping pet chimpanzees that they domesticate and they show like, hey, gentle hands, you know, don't right. hurt people. And the chimpanzees for like five years were totally fine. And then one day um, <laughs> someone checked on the chimpanzee and the chimpanzee, um, for whatever reason, decided to eat their face yeah. and rip their arms off and stuff like that. Joe Rogan loves to talk about this. Um is that evil? I mean, in a sense, it is so horrific. And and the fact that we even look at like, or even the example is a lot more common pit bulls, right? So a pit bull yeah. eats a child, right? A small child, the pit bull eats a child. I don't know how many, how often that is, but it's frequent enough that people talk about it as a stereotype of pit bulls that they're eating toddlers and so on. So is <laughs> that evil when a pit bull eats a toddler? I mean, I think the reason why we could consider that evil is because that we actually do think that dogs and other somewhat intelligent mammals are capable of being domesticated and trained and saying like, hey, don't bite. And the fact that animals are capable of like having this kind of primitive morality and we all sense that like animals, like if they love you, they're not going to hurt you. And if they <laughs> really hate you or feel threatened by you, they will hurt you. So, you know, that ability to be trained, the fact that animals then engage in active violence, I think you could say that's evil. Whereas if it's a wild animal, if it's a bear or a lion or something, it's hard for me to at least intuitively feel like that could be evil. Is yeah, that I mean... I'm just talking about human beings. I'm not talking about animals that can can be trained. Well, the and reason then they, why they I say that is because I, I think there there is actually a crucial difference here. And I think it's reflected in traditional Christian theology, which is that, you know, if you ask um, a Christian theologian, and again, there are all kinds of different opinions. But one of the opinions out there is if you say, well, you know, before Jesus Christ came, I guess nobody anywhere was saved except, I guess, technically uh, maybe some people who were in this covenant that God made with Israel, but you had all these people in the Amazon jungle and in the plains of North America and in China and in the Australian aboriginals and the Africans and Europeans. And the vast majority of the Earth's population um, had no chance of being saved or knowing Jesus or being part of God's <laughs> covenant. How do you explain that? And what a, a lot of Christians will say is that, well, um, those people had not yet been introduced to Jesus in order to accept or deny him. And so perhaps when those people die, they are, they go to some, <laughs> I don't know how people want to describe it. If they like some in between zone or something like that, where they have the opportunity to hear the gospel and to accept it or reject it. And to me, that shows that there's a very clear understanding in Christian morality that you cannot be condemned, you cannot go to hell if you don't have the knowledge of what you're doing is wrong. If you don't, if you don't have the choice between accepting Jesus or rejecting Jesus, doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing, because you've never even heard of the guy before, or there's some cannibal on an island in the Pacific, and you're like, hey, don't be cannibals, that's wrong. And they're like, really? We've always been doing this. We didn't know that was wrong. And so you can't, I don't think uh evil is possible without knowledge and i think that's demonstrated in genesis and demonstrated in christian explanations for what happens to people after they die if they've never heard about jesus before um so i think it, to me that that shows very clearly 
that there is at least an intuitive understanding in Christian theology that people can't be evil if they don't know what they're doing is wrong. And in a lot of cases, um, if you've never heard of Jesus before, um, or even it, it, the Greeks talked about this as well of like, in Greece, it was thought of as really bad to be a cannibal. Um, some of their central myths are about the evils of cannibalism. And they said, well, that's not true in every culture. So other cultures do it. And then there are things that we do um, that they think are terrible and crazy as well, like uh, different burial practices. Do you bury your dead or do you burn yeah. your dead and so on? Um, so, so this is how I think of evil, not as like, there's a series of, um, if you violate, like, do not murder, right? Do you know a, anybody a would be evil? Do you know anybody who, who, uh, is doing what you think would be wrong, but doesn't have the knowledge that it's, that it's wrong in, in America? <laughs> yeah. Forgive them for they know not what they do. I actually think that the vast majority of people, um, are generally doing what they think is right or they are confused most people i think there are examples um and particular instances where people say like yeah i know i should do this this and this but no one's watching no one's around so i'm going to do that and then you know you could say hey you're being evil and they'd be like you're right yeah. Um, that's a strong word, but you're right. Yeah. I did something I knew I shouldn't have done. Yep. But, um, for the most part, um, people are, cause it's, it's this question of knowledge, right? So it's not just, we distinguish between shame and guilt because shame is when you know something, you shouldn't be doing something and other people find out yeah. you feel ashamed with guilt it's you've actually internalized it so thoroughly that now it doesn't even matter whether someone finds out or not. And in fact, guilty people will confess because they want other people to know because they're like, I did something wrong and it's so bad that I need to confess to get it off my chest and feel better yep. and to feel relief. So all of this to me fundamentally has to do with this question of knowledge. Do you know what you're doing is wrong? And then do other people know what you're doing is wrong? In the case of shame, um, people, you, they don't want the um, indiscretion or the sin to be revealed. But in the case of guilt, they actually would prefer to confess their sins. And, and I think that's a huge part of the concept of repentance is um, getting liberation, getting forgiveness, having that psychological weight lifted off your chest because you have made some kind of public declaration or you've you know in prayer said hey i'm really sorry i did this please forgive me and because you believe that god is forgiving then you're able to move on with your life whereas if we have all of these rules about what you can or can't do no one can live up to those perfectly and it, it creates a neuroticism it creates um, like in Judaism, there's like uh, 615 laws or whatever, and there's a particular way of doing every single thing. And if you violate it, you're in sin. And it, when you have that level of strict by the books, everything has to be exactly right. Um, the result is this huge psychological weight. And my understanding of early Christianity is you had a lot of people who were from mixed marriages. People were half Jewish and half Greek. I think Timothy was one of these people and even people who no were just, he was um, insecure. Yeah. Yeah. There were a lot of people who were ethnically insecure because they came from mixed marriages or maybe they even were ethnically Jewish, but they grew up as a Phil Hellene. They, they really like Greek culture. They spoke Greek. Um, a lot of the, you know, Hasmodean Kings of Judea, um, you know, they called themselves, um, Basileus, which is uh, Greek for King. They didn't call themselves, you know, whatever the Hebrew term is. This is why we have the term synagogue, by the way. It's a Greek term because this reflects that at that period of the destruction of the Second Temple, um, there were, I think it's uh, Rabbi Ben Zakai was saying, hey, um, we don't have a temple anymore. I've created this new thing. It's called a synagogue. Let's let's uh, have a new, totally new religious practice centered around this. So it's a very traumatic time for Jews, a very uncertain time for Jews. And it created a lot of internal feelings of guilt, like, if we can't sacrifice at the temple, God's uh, going to hate us. If yeah. we're in mixed marriages, God's going to hate us. And so this group, um, there was um, uh, other uh, you know, preachers who were um, 
had very similar messages, but Jesus came along and he said, look, I understand that you feel you were born into sin simply because of who you are, but know that, you know, I'm here to address your specifically Jewish concerns. I'm coming first for, you know, the tribe of Israel, but my gospel extent extends to everyone. And Paul really, um, I think even went further with that when he said, you know, these Judaizers, they don't have the right idea. We should not be holding up the Jewish religion and Hanukkah and the Jewish rituals and circumcision. We should not have anything to do with that. It is totally optional. Do not try to pressure people into that. And so there, the, you know, you can look at this as a spectrum of different options, of different approaches to a cultural crisis, a collapse of civilization. I mean, it would be like if if the White House um, exploded in a nuclear explosion, like Americans would have to deal with that. Like, does the Constitution exist anymore? Should we have a new Constitution? Should we try to go back to the Constitution? Should we, you know, and that's what the Jews were trying to figure out is like, should we build a new temple? Should we have a synagogue system? Should we abolish um, all of these distinctions and start evangelizing to the Gentiles? And when we start evangelizing to the Gentiles, what should we evangelize? It, should it just be Jesus? Should it be Jesus plus circumcision? Should it be Jesus plus circumcision plus Hanukkah? What exactly <laughs> is the right balance? And there were a lot of different um, answers that people were yeah. coming up with. And what ended up happening is this bifurcation between some Jews, uh, we would say remain Jews, but actually um, they continued developing and branching out and changing their religion from what it had been to, you know, what we would refer to as uh, the Tanakh and the uh, got exegesis through the Talmud and the Kabbalah. And so these things were were added on through the 11th century. They were still adding on and developing the Masoretic texts, um, whereas for the Christians, they developed first, you know, Arianism or, or um, Unitarianism was popular. And then ultimately Trinitarianism won out and you had it that was even after the Council of Nicaea. But both of these branches of approach to the problem of of sin and guilt and who are we and what makes us good and what makes us bad. You know, these continue to develop for for over a thousand years after Jesus. So the story didn't end with Jesus. Things kept evolving. Things kept changing. Uh, that's how I see it, at least. I. Um... One of my other co uh, hosts on the JLP network, fellow hosts on the JLP network, Joel Friday of Joel Friday TV, he argues that all people have uh, an, understand an intuitive understanding within of, of right and wrong. Yeah, I think that there are certain things um, that on probably a genetic level we have attractions to and aversions to. And I think one of those is the fact that we are cooperative as a species. You cannot survive as a species. And by the way, this is true for animals as well. I keep bringing in the animals because <laughs> I, I don't, I think that human, the human brain, the human body is actually divided up into components that are more recent and that are more ancient and ancestral. And I think in the case of animals, you can look at two fighting animals and sometimes animals will kill each other. But you notice in these springtime rituals, these mating rituals, is that a lot of animals, when they fight, they don't fight to kill. Right. They fight to establish a dominance hierarchy, but they don't fight to kill because if every time two young males whether it's deers or goats or walruses or whatever, if every time they fought, they fought to the death, there would be none of that species left because yeah. they would just be constantly killing each other. And so <laughs> animals actually have, you could call it a form of ancestral morality is that they'll get mad at each other. They'll get aggressive. They'll get violent. But oftentimes when the wolf lies on its back and puts up it, its paws and says, hey, I'm done. You're the alpha male. I don't want to fight you anymore. They they don't kill that. Um, and we have that concept as humans of mercy of like if someone surrenders, you don't kill them like you capture them. You put them in a POW camp. You put them in prison, whatever you exile them. But you shouldn't kill people who have surrendered. 
And that is not just a human behavior that extends to the animal kingdom. So I would, I would try to uh, come to an understanding with you and your friend, Joel, that so, yeah, uh, I think there are things <laughs> that are um, hardwired into us that extend into the animal kingdom that are genetic in origin that we have as conscious human beings. We've rationalized those, we've written them down in religious texts and things like that. Um, but I think that we do have a deep sense of morality um, that extends to a lot of um, a lot of life. And there are a lot of things that are, uh, I think, pretty divorced from that. I think, like I said, I, I think that the 615 commandments or mitzvot are probably not something hardwired into humanity. Um, but yeah, there are some things that it seems like this is not even just a human thing. This is just like being a mammal. Like we all kind of intuitively feel this. You've said, you mentioned uh, passive aggressive behavior and all that stuff. I think the reason I'm asking about this stuff is because I think that um, I think everybody's evil. And so in America, we have there is this spiritual war of good versus evil. I believe that. But when it's Republicans versus Democrats or Trump supporters versus anti-Trump people or whatever issue, it ends up being, even if you're on the morally correct side of the issue, because I believe there is are morally correct sides of most of these issues, it still ends up being evil versus evil because people are just nasty with each other, hating one another and passive aggressive or outright aggressive and or this victim mindset, bully mindset, it's a whole bunch of evil versus evil. And so I see that I, I think that that's what's causing a lot of the decline in America. Yeah, I mean, I think you're on to something there, which is that um, people on both sides of the aisle seem to be and i would say it tends to be more on the left than the right i really do think that a lot of right wingers um as much as i have problems with them and disagree with them i genuinely think that they're and, and again this is um i think you're right is that it's both both there's bad people on both sides right but i think a lot of right wingers if you said you know what's your ideal america they would be like well you know you're not going to be able to get a basket weaving degree but you know, everyone should have a job and everyone should be able to get married and everyone should be able to have kids. So they're actually very um, universalistic in their idea that, you know, everyone has certain rights and everyone has certain opportunities, um, whereas the left tends to be more revenge focused and retribution focused and redistribution focused of, well, these people in the past were mistreated and therefore, um, because you are white or because you are conservative or because you are Christian, um, you need to make some sacrifices. Things need to be taken from you and given to these other people. Um, but I, I would agree with you outside of, you know, this caveat that increasingly I do see instances where conservatives are like, um, I hope Putin kills all the Ukrainians because <laughs> yeah they're just shills for the wef and it's like you know those are human beings and right. they're not even that different from russians yeah. um or a lot of the discourse around the war in gaza like you know when jordan peter you know i started to read one in jordan peterson's books and he's like how can we prevent the collectivism of the 20th century from causing these mass killings and then he's on twitter and he's like give them hell net and yahoo and i'm like did you forget like the entire reasons for your existence, which was to prevent collective identities from fueling mass violence? And now you're you're saying this. So yeah. it's very um, it is. I mean, I think you're not really wrong to say that people have like these evil, sadistic intentions toward um, the people that they view as the out group. And um, I don't know if on some level we can. Um, totally rid ourselves of that because if i look at you know ancient mythologies um you know greek mythology is one that i look into a lot but there's always a villain there's always a bad guy there's always a dragon or a demon or a host of demons or a host of giants or titans 
And people who are um, evil, who are defiled, who are profane, and it is the hero or the heroes or the gods or God or the prophets who come in and they smite. I mean, this is St. George, right? He, he slays the dragon. Now that's a supposedly Christian image, but that story is much older than St. George. It goes back way far beyond St. George. Um, so that idea of good versus evil, if we, if, if that's almost unavoidable, which I think base, if you're, if you have any sort of morality, it's, um, or even speak a, a language, I think it's impossible to avoid this idea of good versus evil. Yeah. Um, and it's almost impossible to avoid saying, you know, we are the good people and they are the evil people. I think that the Christian concept of turning the other cheek and loving your enemies is really the closest that um, the major moral systems get to. The Baha'i faith also has a kind of pacifism to it and a love your enemy. I mean, they recognize Jesus as a prophet. Buddhists generally um, believe that those Christian teachings are correct. Um, so I wouldn't say it's exclusively Christianity, but definitely there is something unique about Christianity in terms of really saying, hey, there are no good people and bad people. Evil is something that is within us. And I think that's also, um, if you go back for, further enough, I think you find that teaching in Zoroastrianism of focusing on, you know, it's not, and and that's something that Dostoevsky said, right? That um, good and evil cut down the center of every human heart. It's not something about, oh, you know, we're good and they're bad, but, you know, everyone is in a struggle against evil. I think that uh, th there's something really unifying to that. And if you, if you want to have a society with all different kinds of people, then it really does have to be like, a Christian or a Buddhist or a Baha'i society. It has to be a society where the moral ideal is no, we don't hate on other people for being different from us. We try to seek understanding. Evil is something that is within us. It's not, you know, an us versus them situation. That's the only way to have a um, large scale multicultural or imperial society um, is to have that kind of morality be paramount. And when we deviate from that, and we start getting into this idea of no, you know, liberals are good and the conservatives are bad. Or, it, it, that's what I call this kind of religious revolution where Christianity is no longer the dominant religion. And so as a result, all of this polarization has popped out. I mean, it should be of no surprise that when the dominant unifying religion that told us all not to hate each other and not to kill each other, um, when that falls apart, people start to hate each other. They start to say, you know, I'm glad that the, the those people are dying or, yeah. you know, I, I it was interesting um, that John Stewart segment where he was like, well, you may not think that American public transportation is clean, but that's the price of freedom. And it was just <laughs> such a strange turn of phrase because, you know, a lot of people were like, hey, isn't this what George Bush was saying during the Iraq war? And people are like, why are we going to war? This is crazy. Why are we killing these people? We don't even know who they are. And he was like, it's the price of freedom. So it's like this kind of and the Patriot Act too. <laughs> um, suggestion of like, oh, don't, you know, don't scrutinize this. Don't look at this like freedom necessitates that we have to make some sacrifices, um, you know, even the, if that compromises our morals. So what does freedom yeah, mean at that it's, point? It's, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was saying, what does freedom mean at that point? Free By freedom, he's basically saying freedom for the... Uh, homeless and the criminals to kind of run wild and be and lower the quality of life for everyone else around them, specifically the middle, the so-called middle classes, as you were saying earlier. It's true. Um, I, I, I also bring this up because I think I know that you're writing this book, or at least you mentioned that you were writing this book on the right wing, the dissident right from centuries back to today and how they used to be large and in charge, and now they're uh, on their fringe. They, their ideas that used to be mainstream now are considered extreme and all that stuff. I think that part of it is my contention. You brought this up last time I talked to you. 
that women started getting really in, really behind uh, the Christianity, the conservative Christianity, and started pushing a lot of these things, becoming extreme with them. They started pushing the, people like to hate on the prohibition era. They were behind the prohibition, I heard. You mentioned that last time you were on. Um, and so there was this opposite backlash to the women going too far with it. The men allowed these women to become uh, overly, they became Nazis, if you will. O by Nazis, I mean overly strict with uh, pushing the morality on people by force rather than just encouraging it and, and living it and letting people to an extent be drunks uh, quietly. But now people are just shamelessly drunks and all that, partly in overreaction to the women going too far. And now the women are all, all a bunch of liberals. <laughs> so I think that the women, because uh, women become, there is this 1984 quote of women becoming, I think it's George Orwell, 1984, right? Where women beca became more bigoted in pushing the establishment uh, values. They became, they became team big brother or whatever it was, team Christian, team SJW, team anti-racist, team racist. Some of the women that I know are uh, very critical of Jews right now. And so they're, so they're, they go further with it and beat people over the head with it more than the men who are critical of Jews, for example. So I think that the, I think that part of the decline of the right wing was allowing the spirit of going overboard with it um, and the women going overboard with it specifically led to our decline on the right. And now we're just hating each other and the infighting. And that's why I mean evil versus evil because evil is not just attacking. The right wing evil people are not just hating the left, they're hating one another. I know there was, a, there was a few different points, but it's the women, yeah, the I, hatred. I've never heard. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in what you have to say. I don't generally hear. I mean, I hear people say things like, oh, women destroyed civilization when they got the right to vote. They made everything liberal. But you're not exactly saying that. You're right. actually saying like women became hyper conservative and created this unbalance in society and upset everything and turned the tables. And then when the dust settled, everything was flipped upside down and now we can't put it back together anymore. And I think like it, it's a, it's not something you generally hear put that way. And it doesn't, um, yeah, I, it, it's very interesting though. And yeah, I would love to explore that and think about that more. Um, I, I agree with you that generally speaking, the progressive era that we're talking about, which was an era of so many different moral causes, right? So it was prohibition, but it was also fighting child labor and fighting for workers' rights and fighting for the eight hour workday and fighting for abortion rights and fighting for, um, you know, and teaching evolution in schools and all of these different issues that were disruptive to traditional societies. Like, what do you mean child labor? Like, it's just labor. We all, I mean, <laughs> we you're all six years work. old, you can do chores. I mean, look, there's, there's work to be done. So what's, what is the issue here? Why, what's, what is the moral panic? I mean, people have always been drunks. Why attack this now? Why ban it? I mean, there is no point in Christian history in terms of Christian states like France, Germany, England, there's never a state that banned alcohol. That's not, <laughs> that was not a medieval practice. Everyone was drinking alcohol. Kids were drinking alcohol. So why suddenly are you upsetting thousands of years of European and Christian history and saying all of a sudden, nope, we just determined alcohol should be illegal. It's like, where do you get the moral right to do that? Who, who, who made you God? Who made you a new prophet that you can? But the thing is, and it's really interesting, and I, I would love to um, really get into this because it's such a fascinating idea, is that during this period, the progressive era preceded by the Victorian era, there were a lot of prophets coming out like Joseph Smith and uh, saying, yeah, 
I just received a revelation from God. We're going to do this completely new thing. Now, the question is, if we accept this to be true, that the burnt over district of New York, which is where Joseph Smith and a lot of these other Christian revivalists came from, um, if that is true, that there was a progressive or Victorian hypermoralization that, you know, we're going to start banning all these things. I mean, the Mormons are teetotalers, right? They don't drink alcohol. They don't even drink tea, right? They're very, they don't drink coffee. So where yeah. is this coming from? Why are people hypermoralizing? Why are they jumping on these bandwagons and getting hysterical about things that used to not be a problem? And to me, the answer to that broadly is that people felt in the 19th century that Christianity was in crisis. And that's not something that's easy for us to understand today because we're like, what do you mean? Like they had churches, people went to church, people are Christian. Now, you know, a minority of people go to church. We're in so much of a bigger, uh, for the Christian church is in such a big crisis today versus where it was 200 years ago. What do you mean that crisis of the 19th century? But the truth is that the enlightenment philosophers like Voltaire were not popularly received. There would be people like Frederick the Great and a, a court of nobility who would read a Spinoza or a Voltaire or an Edward Gibbon and these um, you know, 18th century arguments against Christianity. But those didn't become popular or publicly acceptable until the 19th century with people like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. And that was the first time and even um, you know, uh, uh, Charles Darwin, right? Theory of evolution. Yeah. It was the first time where elites, non-Christian elites, actually started to publicly proselytize people like Bruno Bauer um, in, in uh, Switzerland and Germany. And they were moving around a lot because local authorities would be like, hey, you can't say Jesus was fake or you can't be an <laughs> atheist. We're going to yeah. kick you out of here. And so a lot of these people who were Freemasons or communists or Republicans or atheists, they would be bouncing around Europe because they would keep getting chased out of town. But the thing is, they were never killed. And the fact that they had access to the printing press means that, yeah, they would have to move from one town to the other, but they could continue writing. They could continue publishing. They could continue distributing that those ideas. And, it, and because of the culture of literacy that had been ingrained through the Protestant Reformation, right? Everyone needs to read the Bible. Everyone needs a personal relationship with the word of God. And so the common person by this time was actually literate and capable of reading like, okay, what does Schopenhauer have to say? What does Bruno Bauer have to say? And so this was the first time in European Christian history where people were actually allowed to just be like, I don't believe in Jesus. And although it wasn't popular, right? Although atheists were nowhere as near a big group as they are today, the fact that they were tolerated sent a message. Everyone felt implicitly like, oh, we don't burn atheists at the stake anymore. <laughs> like we don't, we, there's no more inquisition. We don't kill these people. We're religiously tolerant. And therefore, what does that mean for the future and the status of Christianity? Like, where are we as a civilization? Because for 1300 years, if you came out and said, oh, I don't believe in Jesus, you would just be killed. I mean, that was just the normal thing. And so the fact that in the, the 19th century, for the first time, you had public intellectuals, professors at universities, all of these very rich and famous people and writing tracts and popular writings and saying like, hey, um, what if the Bible isn't true? Or what if Jesus didn't exist? Or what if God doesn't exist? And while the majority of people didn't say like, oh, yeah, I'm going to abandon my beliefs and join you, the fact that it was even tolerated created a crisis of confidence that I think led to the behavior you're describing, which is that hypermoralization, like doubling down, like, yeah. uh, we're kind of uncertain. So when you're uncertain, just be like, now we're going to be super Christians and now we're going to ban alcohol and we're going to go to Utah and we're going to found a new religion and you know, have uh, latter day prophets and things like that. So that's the, um, the narrative I would try to use um, to kind of dovetail with what you're saying, because I think it's very interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, honestly, I hadn't considered that even back then, it was kind of the last gasp of Christianity of the Christian church, the Christians trying to hold on to their 
their ideas of Christianity. Um, I see that as kind of what was going on in the beautiful South where they started lifting up these Confederate um, American hero monuments in the early 1900s, first few decades, because they were trying to hold on to the, the Southern heritage and heroes because they saw this, um, the bubbling of the so-called civil rights movement uh, rising up in the establishment against them. So they started doing these things. And it's kind of like us doing the Defense of Marriage Act right before they uh, never honored it and did the, or even Prop 8 here in California. We voted for Prop 8, which was marriages between a man and a woman, and it was never enforced. The courts said no, and then they pushed so-called same-sex marriage on us. It's these, all these, all these symbolic statements that we're trying to claim, and everybody's like, based, or at least the Christians are like, based, and actually, no, we're quite debased, and you're fighting a losing worldly battle. Yeah, no, I, I definitely look at things like Christianity um, from the perspective of um, those who propagate culture, those who maintain culture, um, and those who change culture. And the, the, the first category and the last category are ultimately more similar than they are to the middle. And so, you know, for 1300 years, um, give or take, depending on the region of Europe, there were bishops and kings and princes and knights and nobility and upper class people, literate people, um, although, you know, some, some of these kings didn't even read or write if you go back far enough. But these were the most educated people. These are the most powerful people. And what they did is they went around at first to the population. They didn't have them read the Bible. They didn't even really read the Bible to them just as a text. They actually developed these beautiful manuscripts. If you look back nice. at medieval manuscripts, you find these beautifully. I mean, of course, the art isn't as sophisticated as the Renaissance or something. But for the time, that was the most advanced media technology they had. That was their... Um, social media that was their ai that was their um hollywood right it was these beautifully illustrated gold um you know enamel uh pictures that they would show and they'd say this is king david this is jesus this is saul this is solomon and they would teach people really through pictures and storytelling and they would do it first among the elites, they would do it first among, you know, tribal chieftains and people who had local power. And then that would be distributed and disseminated to the people. And this process, if you look, um, for instance, in Hungary or something, the, the Hungarian king um, converted to Christianity around the year 1000. Probably at that time, um, not all of the people in Hungary were Christians. But if you fast forward to 200 years later, pretty much all of the people in Hungary are Christians. Wow. There's really not a lot of pagans running around. And so I would say that when you have a change in the beliefs of the elite, the downstream trickle down effect onto the average population has a delay time of about eight generations or 200 years, give or take. It's not an exact scientific determination, but I see in the West, um, people like in uh, the early 16th century, people like Rudolf II, who were really questioning um, this whole Protestant versus Catholic divide. They were like, well, I just want to have an empire. I just want to have a state. <laughs> I want it to run well. I don't care about these doctrines. And is the Pope good? Is the Pope evil? I just want a religion that works. And so they started to fund things that had already been going on, but they were very interested in things like alchemy and Kabbalah. And there's this idea of like, uh, the, I would call this like a proto Freemasonry because the central doctrine of Freemasonry is like, all religions are kind of true. We're not really doctrinally wedded to any particular religion. There's this kind of universal religion, universal brotherhood of man that even transcends Christianity 
Um, so it's it's the, like a perennial concept. Um, so this period, I would say the 16th century is when you start to get these kind of proto Freemasonic ideas surrounding alchemy and, as and astronomy, right? Ty Tycho Brahe, and it, it starts to conflict with church doctrine, um, Galileo, right? So there's this kind of early, um, you know, Renaissance um, idea of moving away from dogmatic Christianity. Now, Rudolf II, I don't think he hated Jesus or anything like that. I think he believed Jesus was real. He probably thought he was a descendant of Jesus because there were a lot of those <laughs> wow. things going on at the time. Yikes. So the, the European nobility in the 16th century was not anti-Christian, but they were coming out and saying, we are not doctrinally Christian. We're interested in Islam. We're interested in Kabbalah. We are not strictly wedded to Christian doctrine or dogma. And that evolved later on with the Enlightenment, got to the point where, yeah, you had people like Gibbon and Voltaire saying, like, we don't even agree with the Bible. We think the Bible is evil. It's too violent. We don't like it. Um, and it's not until 200 years later that you actually start to get like common regular people identifying as atheists or agnostics or non Christians in any large number. Um, so that that process, that or that development, um, a shift once you have an elite that says, well, first, we don't really care about the doctrines of the dogmas, but we're still basically Christians. We still believe in Jesus. We just have some maybe heretical ideas about him um, to the point of, OK, we don't believe in Jesus anymore in the um, 18th century with Voltaire and Gibbon. And then the 19th century, um, people like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche who are like, well, we don't believe in Jesus and we're going to publicly say it to the average common person. And then by the 20th century, you finally get like popular movements like Marxism, Crazy. where like you maybe have a working class guy and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm a Marxist. And it's like, whoa, OK, that's that's um, really different from traditional European religion. Jocko. We're at the end of the show, man. I have to end for uh, Joel Friday TV coming up next. Um, tell the people how to get you on Twitter, YouTube, Substack, and wherever else you'd like them to see. Yeah, you. I'm trying to uh, fiddle around more with uh, Twitter. So it's DL Jockel on Twitter. Um, J O K L. D L J O K L. Yeah. Yeah, I, that might be an inconvenient Twitter handle. I'm sure there's some kind of search engine optimization I need to do on that. But the place that you will be able to find me uh, where I do my serious stuff is the Substack deepleft.substack.com. Posting a lot of articles there. Um, most of it is totally free and public. I do um, occasionally do some paywalled stuff. Um, the YouTube channel, I've just realized that um, to be successful on YouTube, you need to play a very specific game. And I don't I'm not really interested in that game. It right. doesn't interest me. I'm not excited by it. I'm not motivated by it. Um, so my YouTube channel is kind of in in a it's derivative of my sub stack. I'm going to be putting up some readings of articles on on YouTube like I've done um, with that uh, Yarvin Hanania debate. Um, but otherwise, the focus of the content is uh, Substack and derivative of that is um, YouTube. But yeah, that's where to find me. And uh, I really appreciate you bringing me on. And yeah, it's uh, it's always interesting to talk with somebody where I don't I don't um, I don't always get to interact with someone as you know, kind of, ec well, maybe ecumenical is not the right word, but you're you I think we share a desire to um, not get stuck on the disagreements and to try to find out, um, well, how can we find some common ground? So I really appreciate that. All right, man. Well, take care. Um, guys, I'll get to your super chats tomorrow and your calls. Appreciate you guys for bearing with me. Um, have to read your supers tomorrow. Thanks again, Jockel. And adios, guys. Enjoy. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's time to rise and shine from Bullfrogs and Butterflies. Joel Friday TV coming up next. Bye, all. Thank you, Hassan. See you later, Jocko. Good morning, good morning. It's time to rise and shine. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I hope you're feeling fine. The sun is just above the hill. Another day for us to fill with all the things we love to do. Okay.
you hear? It's calling you. Good morning, good morning, good morning, I hope you're feeling fine. Come on and get up, get out of bed, you gotta get up, you're sleepy head. The day is dawning just for you and all your dreams are coming true. Doodly doo, doodly doo, doodly doo. Good morning, good morning, good morning, it's time to rise and shine. To our Friday good morning, TV. Good morning, it's time to rise and shine. Good morning, good morning, good morning, it's time to rise and shine. Good morning, good morning, good morning, it's time to rise and shine.